it's not what it used to be, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Uh, he's been working a lot with uh, how you deal with people and decision making and how that affects things, which I think is very valuable, especially to engineers. And it kind of fits in very well with how we try to work with people. So I, I think without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, to you, Dr. Jaspersky. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. All right, everyone. So let's talk about decision-making for engineers. And we're going to be basing this in extensive research in neuroscience and behavioral science about how we behave and how our mind causes us to behave in good ways and in some bad ways. So the first part of it will be about some of the mistakes we tend to make. And the second part of it will be about some of the ways we can address these mistakes. Now, the first thing to do is thinking about decision-making in daily life. It's not even in work, in daily life. Let's think about being confident. Now, you've probably heard that in making decisions, you need to be confident. It doesn't only apply to the work setting. It applies to other settings as well. Like I said, personal life. Let's say you're driving a car. It's going to be important for you to be confident when you're merging onto a highway to not slow down. It's important to speed up. And, and the same thing when you're changing lanes. It's important to speed up rather than slow down, to show confidence when you're doing that. So when you're thinking about driving, how good are your driving skills, would you say? So about yourself, thinking about your driving skills, let's take a look at a poll. And so please vote on whether you are in the top half or in the bottom half of all, of all drivers. So the top half or bottom half of all drivers, where would you put yourself? So about half of you participated, make sure the rest of you make your voice heard. All right, so we see that 83% of us are in the top half and 17% of us are in the bottom half. Now, you're engineers, you know that's not the way it works. <laughs> you know that average is average. We should be have a bell curve distribution, should be maybe, even if you're a little bit above average, should be no more than 60%. But this is the kind of results I get in other presentations to IE, IEEE or other people, because we tend to suffer from a problem called the overconfidence bias, where we tend to be too confident, way too confident about decision-making. When people say they're 100% confident about something, you know, bet the farm, bet your career, you know, bet the house, you're only going to be right about 80% of the time on average. So when we look at research, when people say they're 100% right, they would be right about 80% of the time. So no wonder that Las Vegas makes so much money, right? This is, and no wonder that the smart money in the stock market makes so much money against retail investors. This is a serious problem for us. Our tendency to be too confident is especially dangerous for people with more experience, more authority. So if you think of the overconfidence, it would tend to be people who are more experienced. So if you've been let's say, professor for a longer period of time, and I've been a professor for a while, there tends to be a sense that, hey, my knowledge is right, I shouldn't change my mind. That's when you look at how paradigms change in academia, it tends to be not because individual people change their minds, but because older generations die out. And because people tend to be more stuck in their mindsets, more confident, the older and more experienced they get. And so this is a problem. I mean, the, there was a study, for example, on doctors. So there was a comparison of some young doctors who just finished medical school and some older doctors who are out of medical school for at least a decade, some senior doctors. And they were given a case example of a patient to diagnose and recommend a course of treatment. And they got the case example diagnosis and recommendation of course of treatment right at about the same rates, the junior doctors and the senior doctors. But the senior doctors were way more confident, meaning that they were much less likely to change their minds once evidence showed that their original diagnosis was not correct. Now, why is that? Well, why did they get it right at the same rate? Of course, senior doctors have more know-how and experience, but junior doctors, of course, have fresher knowledge just coming out of medical school. And 
that is why they got it right at about the same rate, but the senior doctors were way more confident. So this is a problem for us. So you want to realize that a tendency that people often say is, you know, go with your gut, you're not sure what to do, you don't have like 100% data, you should go with your gut, trust our, your intuition, follow your heart, and so on. So you hear that often, you hear that from, you know, both pop culture gurus like Tony Robbins, who tells says be primal, be savage, or even gurus who are claim to have more research basis, like Malcolm Gladwell, who says, you know, in blink, make your decision in the blink of an eye. That's a problem. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a good reason they get paid a lot of money. These gurus to get tell you to tell you what feels comfortable for us to do. So our gut, trusting our gut, feels very comfortable. It feels very good to us, but it can lead to some disastrous decisions because our gut reactions, our intuitions, did not evolve for the modern environment. I mean, think about it. The modern environment, with us being able to interact like this on a small screen doing remote work. I mean, that's a major topic we can talk about in the Q&A. That's been about around for the last decade or so, but we've not evolved for it. We've tried to adapt for it, but we're not evolved for it. Our intuitions are misaligned with doing work remotely, many, many other aspects of the modern environment. Our intuitions are misaligned. And our intuitions are very well aligned with the ancient savannah. That's what we evolved for. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, were hunters, gatherers, foragers. That's what our intuitions are good for. And as a result, we have a series of dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the specific ways that our brain is miswired. That comes from our evolutionary background, like I talked about, and just the structure of our brain. The structure of our brain has a lot of heuristics, shortcuts, because our brain is designed to be lazy, meaning using the least amount of energy. In the savannah environment, that was very important because we had very low calories. We had to fight for every calorie and the brain used a lot of glucose when it does its thing. And so the brain is designed to use as little glucose as possible, as little energy as possible, and make decisions as quickly as possible with minimal information available. And in certain situations, like overconfidence, that causes it to go, you know, make serious errors. Well, the other thing about overconfidence I want to mention, the reason, of course, it's there is because it's important, it was important in the savannah environment when we lived in hunt, like hunter-gatherers to make decisions very quickly. You know, when you, when you heard a sound, you had to decide very quickly whether it's a saber-toothed tiger or just a branch breaking. And it was very beneficial for us, for our survival, for our, the survival of our ancestors to leap to conclusions, the most, to leap to conclusions quickly and make the decision quickly. And so that it was important for us to be overconfident. It was better for us to jump and run away at a hundred shadows, hundred kind of, you know, branch breaking events, rather than miss that one saber to tiger. We're the descendants of those who jumped at a hundred sounds and well, not the descendants of those who missed the saber to tiger because they refused to jump at the sounds because they waited for more information to be more confident. In the modern world, we have many, many less dangerous environments that we face, but we still get in a lot of trouble because we get in a lot of trouble now because of that overconfidence, because of the jumping to conclusions. So that's an example that sort of dangerous judgment error and how it's linked to that savannah environment. Another dangerous judgment error that's so overconfidence bias, really important for engineers to address. Another one is called the planning fallacy. The planning fallacy. We assume it feels to us like the future will go according to plan. You've probably heard the phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Unfortunately, that's kind of a misleading phrase. It suggests that, hey, if you make a plan, everything will go fine. That's not the way it works in reality. In reality, if you make a plan, then you really need to be thinking about how can this plan go awry? So a much better phrase is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. That's what I teach people to use. That's a much, much better phrase. But that's not the way we think. That's not how it feels to us. Our gut feels that when we make a plan, everything should go according to plan. Because we like ourselves, we are confident about ourselves, 
And when we make a plan, we feel confident that everything will go fine we, because we feel good about it. We're the ones who made it. And so that's something that we really underestimate, all the problems and challenges that can come with the problems, risks that can come with the plan. So we underestimate the resources we need of time, money, information, social capital. <laughs> Interesting study about this done on college students. So there were college students who had a term paper due, so the final paper of the term. And they were separated to two groups. One group was asked, if at the midpoint of the semester, oh, if you know, everything goes perfectly, if everything goes great, how much time do you anticipate you'll need to finish up the term paper? And they said eight weeks. And then another group was asked, well, how much time do you think you'll need to finish up the term paper? And they said, eight weeks. <laughs> so that is an example of how our intuitions lead us astray very often in educational settings and in all sorts of other settings. So if you're thinking about, let's say, software engineers, you know, how much time will it take you to make this program or you know, various schematics or write a grant, how much time will it take you to write a grant? It's very intuitive for us to equate the best case scenario with the actual scenario, that we think that the best case, that what will happen in reality is the best case scenario. Of course it doesn't. There will inevitably be delays in the vast majority of cases. And we might require some more resources of various sorts, we might require more information, more social capital, money, as well as time. But we don't anticipate that. That's not part of our intuition. Now, let's talk about this example of the planning fallacy. How important do you think it would be for you and your team to the extent that you're part of a team to address this planning fallacy? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, I see that 83% of you participated. Give five more seconds to the last person to make their voice heard. Okay, so we see that two thirds of you would find it highly valuable and a third of you would find it moderately valuable. So great, so everyone finds it valuable, highly or moderately. So I suggest you think about this, this problem and think about how you can address it in your own work, in your team's work, because this is a definitely a big challenge that I've seen with engineers be a serious issue. All right, let's talk about another problem, normalcy bias. So normalcy bias is the tendency to assume that the future will be normal, much like today. So think about yourself in five years from now. What do you imagine yourself to be in five years from now? Now think about it. The large majority of us would imagine us to be largely like ourselves, share our values, share our preferences, our habits, our intuitions, be a little bit smarter, a little bit older, hopefully a little bit wiser, experienced, and maybe some more money, whatever other things like that. So that's us in five years from now. But take a moment to think about yourself five years ago. So five years ago, think about who you were like as a person. If you think of yourself five years ago, you probably have some values that are somewhat different than they are right now. You maybe have some different habits, some different predispositions, some different ways of looking at the world, different sort of resources, interests, and so on, different relationships. But it's completely not intuitive to, re to realize that the way we changed over the last five years is likely to be similar to the way that we will change over the next five years. The past history is the best predictor of future events, right? And that's not intuitive to us. We don't feel that. We feel that the future will be normal. And whether that applies to ourselves or the world. Now, you've probably heard about G chat GPT coming out with open AI, you've, you've read the headlines, and not that many people are realizing what kind of an impact on the world chat GPT will have. 
And that's just an example of something, of a new tool that might be world transforming that chat GPT combined with a number of other AI tools like DALI, Art Generation, and Lumina AI, and other AI tools that are going to pretty drastically transform the world quite possibly in five years. And there's not a guarantee, but it's an example of something that's developing right now. And of course we have other issues. What about the pandemic? You know, we had a pandemic that was tra transformed the world in fundamental ways. Many of, more of us are working remotely. Many more of us have different predispositions about our preferences, leisure time and so on. But we tend not to think about these things and how we changed over the last five years. It might, we might change more over the next five years, depending on what the world will be like, right? So we tend to have this assumption and we underestimate the short the, the changes in the future. We forecast short-term future and the long-term future based on the long-term past. So we underestimate major disruptions, major serious disruptions to our lives and to the world and to our organizations. Now, how valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to address this problem, the normalcy bias? Please go ahead and vote. All right. Five of you participated. We still have one more. I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. All right, so we see that this was even more important than the planning fallacy. 80% perceive it as highly valuable and 20% as moderately valuable. So again, really important clearly to take next steps to address it. Good. So let's talk about how to address these problems. So talking about, so we talked about some of the problems, some examples of these problems over confidence bias, Planning fallacy, normal mostly bias. There are many, many others. There are over a hundred cognitive biases. I gathered together the thirty most dangerous ones for professional settings. The thirty most dangerous cognitive biases in an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which can help you evaluate their extent and impact in your workplace, and in your own work. And if you're a student in your own work as a student, if you're a professor in your class and all in your research grant applications. So it provides you with the next steps for addressing them. So let's take a look at this assessment. I want you to open up the chat. We'll be using the chat for this portion of the presentation. So this is the beginning of the assessment. Let's go through it. This is the description. I should mention this. So the directions. Each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. So think about how often it occurred in your work, in your workplace, and your studying over the past year. The answer for each question will be in percentage terms. Don't overthink it. Just give your first initial impression. This should take you 15 to 20 seconds per question. So let's take a look at question number one. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in the past year? So what percentage of projects in your experience in your workplace? Please chat that in the chat. So please go ahead and chat, put it into the chat. So 70%, 5%. Other folks, what are your impressions of how many projects? 
Anyone else wants to share? Think about it again. Should should take <laughs> not busy enough, right? <laughs> you take on more projects, Steve. Okay, other people are thinking about it. Let's in the meantime go to number two. Percentage of team conflicts that occurred because someone in the conflict overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and persuasiveness. So this is number two. So Daniel says 20%. Other folks, when conflicts occur, how often do they occur because someone overestimated how effective they are communicating and persuading others? 50%. Mm -hmm. 70%. So when you're thinking about these answers, if it's 5 to 10%, like Steve had in the planning fallacy, it's not a big deal, it happens. If it's 10 to 20%, it's kind of becoming more of a moderate problem. If it's more than 20%, it's becoming more of a serious problem and kind of messing with your team, your projects, and so on. So, of course, the first one is about the planning fallacy. And that means that if you're having numbers over 20%, then you're misallocating resources. Team conflicts that occurred because someone overestimated the effectiveness of their skills, that's about the illusion of transparency, where we tend to perceive that we are highly effective at communicating to others and we are much less effective in reality. This is an illusion that we are transparent, that our messages, our mental states, our emotions are transparent to others. It's actually much harder for others to read our messages and communications and much harder for them to communicate effectively. So we need to over communicate and check to make sure the other person understood our communications. Number three, of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about the decision? Please go ahead and share your thoughts of all significant decisions over the past year. So when you pay 5%. Mm -hmm. So in our what, group or in our organization? You can answer for either, depends on what you want to do. Either is fine. Again, this can be applied to your group, to your organization, to your own work, so. 75%. Okay, good. So this is, of course, about the overconfidence bias. So clearly, this is a pretty serious issue. All right, so this is the assessment. And I'd like to do all to see how... And there are 27 more questions like this. Now, how valuable do you think it would be for you and your team, your group, your organization to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases uncovered? by the assessment. Please go ahead and vote. See that two thirds of you participated. So I'll give five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, good. So we see that, yeah, so people find mostly highly valuable, four fifths of you, and the other fifth finds it moderately valuable. So great. So take this, take the assessment yourself. I'll send you a copy after the presentation and apply it, take it yourself, have your group take it to the extent that you can get other people to take it, do that as well, because they'll help everyone address these cognitive biases. Okay. Now, once you uncover these cognitive biases, what can you do? Well, there are five questions you can use to avoid decision disasters. So this is a very effective technique that helps you address a number of cognitive biases. So it's five questions you can use that address a number of cognitive biases, prevent them in advance while you're making the decision, and to give you a good enough answer. So this is not perfect. This is not a technique that's meant to take for the most important decisions. And when you're making a very important hire or something like that, but for or you know, 
figuring out your application for a very huge grant, but for a decision that's kind of everyday decisions that you take, you know, five, 10 times a day, it's fine. It's good enough. So it's for good enough decisions. It'll take you a couple of minutes once you learn how to use this technique and I'll send you a decision aid that you can use to do it. It's also a very good technique to do with a group because what you can do is you can have everyone in a group decision, answer the five questions before you come to decision-making meeting and then structure the decision-making meeting around your agenda, around each of the five questions. So start it by having everyone read their answers to each of the questions and then discuss everyone's answers until you come to a consensus of some sort, move through the five questions, and you can be very confident that you have a pretty good decision at the end, and it'll take much shorter than regular group decision-making meetings. So for individuals, for groups, very helpful. First question, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? We tend to not fully consider evidence that goes against our beliefs, that goes against our intuitions. As we talked about before, our intuitions are very powerful. To address that, try to look twice as hard for evidence that goes against your beliefs. Try to prove yourself wrong, in other words. Try to disconfirm your beliefs. Imagine that there is an external peer reviewer within you who is trying to prove you wrong. So try to prove yourself wrong before it gets to that peer review. Try to figure out how this situation, this grant, this proposal, this paper can be criticized. And then trust these criticisms in advance. Address the decision, problems in the decision in advance. Now that's one part of this question. The other part is important information. So the one is part is that fully consider, another is important. We don't want to get stuck on analysis paralysis. And in order to not get stuck on analysis paralysis, you want to decide what information is actually important. What should you consider? And what should you ignore, leave out because it's not very important. Next, what dangerous judgment errors haven't I yet fully addressed? So what evidence didn't you take into account? There are a number of dangerous judgment errors. We talked about several of them already, and the assessment will provide you with more information about the others. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So what would they suggest you do in this situation? Think about that angel on your shoulder. Think about a mentor figure. You take yourself outside of yourself and say, what would you tell someone in your situation to do? You know, we get a lot of the benefit, 50% of the benefit or so, just by taking outside but just by getting that external perspective on ourselves and saying, well, what would I suggest to someone in a similar situation? Or what should someone do in a similar situation? And you get the other 50% of the benefit by going to a mentor, going to an external coach, consultant, or someone like that. Maybe going to your dean, of course, going to your mentor if you're a student. So, Next, you're transitioning from making the decision to implementing it. You know, even if you make the decision and it's right, if you don't implement it well, you're kind of not going to get the right outcome. So how have you addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about that. How have you addressed all the ways, all the problems with this decision, all the ways it could fail? And try to address them in advance because now that you've thought about it, you can address them. And finally, what new information would cause you to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about this decision? So for example, if you're thinking about applying for a grant and what would what would the program manager tell you that would cause you to rethink your assumptions about applying for a grant or something like that. Think about what would cause you to change your decision, to change your mind. What new information can you find out? And that's because we tend to be stuck to a decision once we make a decision. It's called post-factum rationalization. But if we decide in advance that certain information will change our minds, we will not be nearly as stuck to the decision and we can change our minds much more freely. So again, very effective technique for both individuals and groups. As you can see, it takes only a couple of minutes to do just to answer these questions. If it's right for individuals, it takes a couple of minutes to do. And if you find the decision is wrong, you definitely want to take the time to redo it. For a group, it really shortens decision-making meetings and it helps you be much more confident that you get the right decision out of the meeting. Now let's do a poll on this one, the five questions technique. How valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to implement this technique to make good enough decisions? Please go ahead and vote.
All right. So I see that this is, I think, the most popular yet. So over 80% popularity as highly valuable. Great. So again, I'll send you the decision aid and you'll be able to start using this technique. All right. So the key takeaways from this presentation, normalcy bias, planning fallacy, and overconfidence bias are the three biggest challenges that I've seen for engineers undermining decision-making. I need to assess and address these cognitive biases using the assessment and the five questions to avoid decision disasters are very helpful to make good enough decisions every day. The key takeaways. Now, if you're watching this after the presentation, then you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash j event to get the resources. So tinyurl.com forward slash j event. But otherwise, I will send you the assessment and I will send you the decision aid after the presentation, as well as a sample chapter from my best selling book, Never Go With Your Gut How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And you can indicate whether you would like the resources or not in this poll. In the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions. So I could start with one, I think. Um, sure, Steve. What's the balance on, when we look at the five key questions, there's a certain amount of lead time. Uh, is that going to discourage people, do you think? Um, because, oh, well, I have to prep for this meeting. I can't just go in. And how would you address that? Yes, of course. It forces people to pre to actually prep for a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, the thing is, people know that the way the meeting is structured, or you need to inform them, and that the way the meeting is structured is that everyone reads their answer at the start of the meeting to each question. So mm -hmm. if they have not answered the questions, they're kind of, you know, out of luck <laughs> it will be very obvious to everyone and no one wants to be in that position <laughs> so you know, i have observed groups you know the, the first time that somebody was in that position afterward everyone actually did their homework <laughs> everyone prepped so yes uh, it's definitely something that you need to inform people that everyone will be expected to read their answer and then just have that and you know, it doesn't take a long time to answer these questions. It takes a couple of minutes. So yes, it forces people to prep, and that's kind of the point, <laughs> because okay. then they're actually going to do the work. Yeah. And you get better results out of the meeting. Of course. Yeah, that's the point, that you get better results. People are prepped, you get better results, so you know you're using an evidence-based methodology that's coming from behavioral science, neuroscience, that actually gets at these cognitive biases. So you get a lot of benefits at once. So at the university, we have somebody who does uh, decision-making coursework. It mm -hmm. might not be bad for me to introduce you to him as well, if sure. you'd be open to that. Sure. I don't think he's on campus right now. but Introduce um, me when he's on campus. I have your email. I'll go ahead and uh, do that quick introduction, maybe. Sure. So anyone else have any questions? or thoughts. Apparently Mizzou has fallen off of the internet uh, this afternoon, so I'll right. follow up with them though. Um, All right, no worries. Well, I hope everyone has benefited from this and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Gleb. Mm -hmm. You're welcome.